He's in his 10th year at MongoDB. He is a distinguished solutions architect. Please give a warm round of applause to welcome Jay. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you guys all saw Rick's talk, so he hopefully got you all fired up and you now believe that you can solve any problem with um, MongoDB better than kind of a relational database. And it's my job today to show you how to do it. So you can decide which one of us has the harder job. So I am a distinguished solution architect with MongoDB. And what that means is, is I'm an engineer tied to the sales team and I help companies that are considering MongoDB for the first time or for new projects to help them evaluate whether or not MongoDB would be a good fit for them. Okay. So often when I meet with customers in that scenario, maybe they've tried MongoDB before and they're running into problems. And they might say things like listed on this slide that, you know, MongoDB is really not a good fit for my use case. You know, it's really hard to model my data as documents or maybe my queries are just not performing well. You know, MongoDB doesn't scale. We're running, you know, ran great on my laptop when I had 100 documents in it, but we loaded 500 million documents and now performance is horrible. Or maybe, you know, I'm looking at Atlas and it's just like way too expensive. How can we, we can't afford five shards of M80s or something to solve this problem. And maybe our queries are hard to write, right? And you could look at that and maybe there is a problem with MongoDB. Maybe it isn't a good fit for the use case. I would say more often than not, though, the problem is really between the keyboard and the chair. It's really you know, the not applying MongoDB in kind of the best way. So let's kind of um, look at that a little bit further. Uh, there's usually there's two main problems, or two main things that are often causing MongoDB not to meet expectation. One is indexes, so you don't have the right indexes on your uh, collections or what have you. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about the other challenge, which is having a document model that is suboptimal for MongoDB. And when we talk about a document model, we'll really talk about how we structure our data in terms of a set of documents, but also what collections we have, um, how many, what the relationships are between them, how we model those relationships. And one of the things that you'll tension you'll see is that if you're used to relational, right, there can be either the bias to break things up too much into you know, lots of tiny collections with small documents, create like a normalized design, or kind of go the other extreme and do everything as a single document and have something that's too denormalized. So we're gonna kind of drill in today on how to do this kind of optimally. And maybe I'll just go the old fashioned way. So before I, um, to go into the details. I just want to illustrate a point here. And we're going to do this in the context of a really simple use case. We've got patients, you know, somebody that's going to go to the doctor, and we've got medical procedures, maybe an MRI or a blood test or surgery or something like that. And right now they're in two collections. And we've got patient documents. You can see those on the left-hand side. We've got procedure documents on the right-hand side. And there are relationships between them, and the blue lines kind of indicate those relationships. So on the patient's document, we have a procedures field, and we've got a list of IDs, and those identify the patients, or identify the procedures that this patient has undergone. And in the procedure documents, there's a patient field that is essentially a pointer or a reference back to the patient that underwent this procedure. Right? And then we can have a situation where our application issues a query like find all patients from New Hampshire that have had chest x-rays, right? And to resolve this query, we need to do a join. Either we can use the dollar lookup operator in the aggregation framework, or we can do the join in our application code, right? We could query the patient's collection for all the patients that have a state of New Hampshire, get that list of patient IDs, and then do a big or on the procedure collection and find all the procedures that those patients have undergone. And we could resolve that query that way. Either way, it's a join, it's gonna be expensive, it's not gonna be great. We could make one minor change to our document model, and all you relational folks are gonna have a heart attack right now, but that's okay. And what we can do is we can move one field from the procedure document into the patient document. And now, if you look at that procedure array, not only just have the ID of the procedure, we also have the type of the procedure. And now I can execute this query just as a simple, assuming I index it, put a simplifying query and execute this query without a join, really easy to write, 
and it's going to perform great. It did require us to duplicate a little bit of information, but what we can do is we can consider the trade-offs, right? If we duplicate this information, all of our read queries are, are really fast. The downside is whenever that type, whenever the name of a chest X-ray changes, you know, somebody in the medical field says we can no longer call it a chest X-ray, we've got to call it a chest XX ray or something like that, we have to go update all of our patient documents. But the real point there is how often is that really going to happen in this scenario in compared to the number of times we're going to execute this query, right? In, the, in most applications, we're going to do these reads to do these kind of query to find all patients from the amplitude of x-rays, you know, thousands or millions of times more often than that field, that label chest x-ray is going to actually change. And so that's kind of the, when we're doing document modeling in MongoDB, is we're going to do that type of analysis. We're going to look at the workload of the application and make these types of design decisions in order to get the best performance. All right, so let's kind of introduce the talk. We're going to, I'm going to talk about three things. The first ones I've kind of already introduced already, why we need to do document modeling whenever we're doing uh, using NoSQL databases. The second is going to be how do we actually do it, you know, what's kind of the procedure? There's actually a methodology, so it's not like um, kind of just guess or an art. And then the final thing is I'm going to walk you through an example of one of these particular strategies. So let's jump in. So first of all, for why do we need to do data modeling, right? So the issue is that we don't have unlimited resources so we need to make sure we optimize, in any engineering problem, we need to optimize our solution to make sure that we can come up with a solution that, that fits within whatever our constraints are. And there are going to be things like how much energy we have, how much time, how much hardware, how much code do we want to write, right? Do we want to, sometimes there are solutions that are going to work great, but they require us to write a lot of code, and maybe we would just prefer to, uh, you know, leverage just the capabilities of the database or a simpler solution, right? And then it's not only just MongoDB in this context, right? We got, if we're running in the cloud, we, there's different capabilities of the underlying cloud provider we're running, or if it's in our own data center, right? We have to take into constraint what type of servers we can get and those types of things. So, and then there's also the capabilities of MongoDB that you need to take into account, right? So what things does MongoDB do well? You know, what, how do we represent data as documents? What types of indexes are available? You know, what, how can we shard or partition to get more capacity? You know, if we need to do uh, updates you know, across multiple documents because of our document model, how ACID transactions work and how they work. If we have complex queries. We have you know, the, the native MongoDB query language. We also have Atlas Search. Can, is, can, we have a doc, can we come up with a document model where we, assuming Atlas Search, maybe it'll perform better? And then finally, um, leveraging some of the newer features in the Atlas platform, like online archive and data federation. So taking all that stuff into account. And I'm going to illustrate this via a really simple use case. So we're going to build a social networking app for chefs, right? So this is a place where if I'm a chef in a restaurant, I can post an article about this new recipe I came up with, and other chefs can comment on it, or maybe they recreate it and it works great, and they can say that, or Maybe they substitute one ingredient for another, and you know, they can comment and share that and what the benefits of it were. You can add tags and comments and categories and things like that. So it's kind of a, you know, you can probably all use the social networking apps. You get the general idea. And if we're using a relational database, we might come up with a schema that looks like this, right? Where we've got people, the chefs, and some basic information around, right? And there's a one-to-many relationship from chefs to the articles that they can create. There's going to be a one-to-many relationship between both the comments that chefs create as well as the comments associated with an article. And then articles can have lots of different tags and being put in lots of different categories like entrees and desserts and appetizers and things like that. So there's a many, many um, relationship between articles and tags and categories. Now in MongoDB, right, yeah, the other point here is, right, this is just third normal form, so, you know, it's just really kind of like one way to do it. You have a, in MongoDB, right, there's lots of ways we could do this. We could create, on the left-hand side, we could create a document per article, and in that document we could put all the tags, all the categories, all the comments, 
all of the, you know, the authors of the article as well as everybody that commented. So we could just have one document per article, that's our only collection, and we could just run with that. Or maybe we decide, hey, you know, the people, people both write articles and they comment on articles, and if we use that schema on the left, we're gonna be replicating that chef's information over and over again. Every article they write, whether it's gonna have their information in it, every comment's gonna have their information in it. So we're, it's, we're gonna duplicate the information all over the place. So maybe what we should do is we should pull the people out. But we'll have an article, we'll still keep the articles, we'll have tags, categories, and comments. And as you can imagine, there's many other permutations. And the real question, or the point of this talk is, how do we decide? What's the, what's the right solution here? Right, and the real po one point I want you to make sure you kind of take away from today is kind of this point. The way you make these decisions, the way you pick the best document model is, is to look at your application and what's the workload like and pick a document model that is going to perform best for your applications. Right, so let's talk about how we actually do this. So the methodology really consists of three steps. We're going to categorize the workload, and I'll kind of drill into each of these. We're going to look at all the different relationships and figure out the best way to model them in MongoDB. And then we're gonna apply a set of schema design patterns that are gonna enable us to essentially tune our document model to get good performance for the queries that our application are gonna act execute. This, is in, this kind of approach is in direct contrast with what you do in relational. Right? What you do in relational is you look at your data and you come up with the ER diagram, put it in third normal form, and then you start writing your queries in SQL to implement the actual query workload. In MongoDB, we're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to figure out what all the queries are and then we're going to figure out, come up with a document model that best satisfies those queries. So drilling into the workload a little bit, what we're gonna do is we are going to look at those different entities, you know, the articles and the people and the comments, and figure out how many of each we're roughly gonna have. And then we're gonna look at the, just identify the list of operations that we're gonna perform, the application is gonna perform, and then we're gonna essentially quantify those. How many of those are we gonna execute per second or per day or per hour? So what you might end up with at the end of that process is a table that looks like this. And this is an example table for that chef application. Right? So if we look at this, there are gonna be a set of operations, a set of common operations where somebody's gonna post a new article. Right? And for that scenario, we're going to, they're gonna provide the author and text. There's gonna be other information, but those are gonna be the two big pieces of information. And in this use case, we're doing 10 of those per day. So this is not a heavy utilized application, but from that perspective. And then the other common right in this particular scenario is the comments. So different chefs are going to be adding comments about different articles, and we're gonna assume that there are gonna be 10,000 of those per day. And roughly each article, you know, after a few months is gonna have around 1,000 comments on it. That's kind of our expectation. And then the reads, the, 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 the query that dominates kind of this application is just people reading articles. And you can see we're doing 10 million of those a day. So on the one point you should really kind of like resonate here is that this 10 million reads per day is several, multiple orders of magnitude greater than all of the other operations combined. So if you're thinking about optimizing this application, this, one, this particular query should be one that you should be really thinking about. We really need to make that one fast because it's gonna happen a lot. And then finally, the other read is going to, there's gonna be some analytical requests by you know, business users that are monitoring the usage of the application, and they're really just trying to understand, you know, kind of is a, are we getting more engagement in this application than we did last month or less? So there's kind of a bunch of analytical queries. And you can see in terms of criticality, they're not as important. If they take a little bit longer, we really don't care. So like I said, we really wanna focus in on this one query that dominates the workload. And, and in most use cases, there might not be one, there may be a multiple, but there's gonna be a set that are just way more predominant than others. So you wanna start there. Right, so if we drill into that one, we can collect some more information about that particular um, 
Query, you can see it's around 115 a second. Not massive in MongoDB scale, but you know, it's much higher than the others. We want 10 millisecond latency. You can see that this read is fairly big, right? The article itself is going to be 5 KB. And then there's going to be 1,001 um, K comments, which in my math is a, is a megabyte. So we're reading, you know, reading one of these articles. If we read in you know, the, the article plus all 1,000 comments, we're going to have to read a megabyte of data. Now, you could, this should also uh, raise some um, suggestions in your mind if there's some optimizations here, right? Because in most scenarios, I would say most people don't read all 1,000 comments. So do we really need to load in all 1,000 comments on every read? But that's kind of like the worst case in this particular scenario. And then the other kind of point here is that we're going to keep a 10-year history, but most of the day, you know, most of the articles are read in the first three years of po posting, and then some older articles are read much less frequently. So if we start thinking about how we're going to model this, the first thing I want you make sure everybody keep in mind is what are my biases by based upon doing kind of relational development? And as I challenge them, kind of give yourself the kind of uh, um, acceptance to maybe consider a different approach and violate some of the rules that you kind of have been drilled into you over time. So let's kind of talk about relationships here. So what the next step we're going to need to do, do is identify all the relationships, you know, look at are they one-to-one, -one, one to many, you know, is it, if it's many, is it is many five or is many five million, those types of things. And then start thinking about do we embed these relationships in documents or reference them? And if you don't know what that means, I'm going to explain that in a second. So just a little background that most of you probably know, but if not, when you store data in a relational database, kind of the analogy is if you had to store a car in a relational database, what you would do is take it all apart and store each of the components of a car in a specially designed container for that component, right? So we'd store the wheels in a container that's specially shaped to store the wheels and, you know, the spark plugs in another container that's specially designed the spark plugs and all those types of things. And when we need our car back, we do a big join and pull the whole thing back together and get our car, right? In the contrast in MongoDB, it's like just pulling your car in the garage, right? You've got this one garage, you store the car together, and this garage can store lots of different shaped cars, right? It can store a Toyota, it can store a Ferrari, it can store a Tesla, right? Just, it's just a very flexible type thing. So that's kind of the difference, and that kind of impacts how we do data modeling in MongoDB. So, and the big kind of decision criteria on whether we store this information together in a document or not is whether it's used together, right? Just like I mentioned with the articles and the comments before, you know, the fact that we have um, a thousand comments associated with an article, do, that they're typically not all used together. Maybe like the first 10 are actually used together. So that's kind of giving us a guideline that maybe we should only store a few comments in the article document, not all 1,000, right? Those types of things. So the way we, there's two ways to model relationships like this in MongoDB. One is by reference and one is called embedding. So let's kind of drill into them a little bit more. So in a relational database, there's really only one way to model relationships. You've got essentially a foreign key relationship between your one, you know, a row in one table to a, you know, a row in another table. In MongoDB, the kind of analogous approach to doing that is called a reference. So if you hear a stage reference, it's kind of a very analogous to kind of relational foreign key relationships where I've got an article that has a reference to uh, one or more comments. Very similar to the way I implemented the patients and procedure example earlier on in the talk. Right? The other option is to embed the information. So just have a single document where we have an array that contains a list of the actual comments. That's the other approach. For those of you who think in JSON, like me, this is kind of what it looks like in JSON, right? On the left-hand side, we've got the reference implementation where we've got a comments field that has a list of identifiers, and those identifiers essentially are references to comments documents in another collection. And on the right-hand side, we have the embedding approach where we've got a comments array where we're just embedding all the comment information in that array in that field. So those are kind of the two 
kind of competing solutions that we're looking at for relationships, and we have to decide for each relationship what is, makes the most sense. And making that decision, there's pros and cons to each one. There's never, you know, the right answer is going to depend on the use case, like I said, but it there's pros and cons to each one, right? So if we're doing reference, if we have many to many relationships, so you've got, you know, many, many on each side, if you do embedding, you're going to end up having to duplicate a lot of information, right? So that's going to be um, a challenge with the embedding. So that's where kind of an advantage of um, referencing is, is, is useful. The other advantage of referencing is that when you're doing updates, you know, if you've got, if you've pulled out, if there's no shared information like you're doing in embedding in many, many relationships, you know, referencing is going to work much better. The other advantage of doing referencing is, like I said, if the, if the related information is not used together with the, the data, like the comments I mentioned, where we've got 1,000 comments and only the first 10 are used, then embedding those, all those comments into this document and they're never read is kind of a waste of resources. Every time we read an article, we're loading in you know, 1,000 comments, that's, and we're only looking at 10. That seems like a waste. On the other side, embedding has some advantages as well. You know, read and write operations in MongoDB are atomic at the document level, right? So what that means is if I read a document or I write a document, that operation is a single atomic operation. I don't have to encapsulate it in an ACID transaction, but I get ACID behavior. So by embedding information, I can ensure that all of these its information is updated atomically. So like if I embed those thousand comments into my article, I can be ensured that I can update five of those comments at the same time in a single MongoDB update statement, and they will be updated as a atomic operation, as a transaction. And I don't have to leverage multi-document ACID transactions, which have some overhead for them. The other thing is MongoDB is a document database, so your bias should always be towards embedding, and you should start to use referencing kind of as the situation necessitates it. But your bias should always be towards embedding. So we've kind of identified the workload. We now understand the relationships. The next step is to apply these set of patterns to, to essentially optimize our document model. So for those of you who aren't familiar with patterns, um, patterns you know, kind of permutate software engineering. You know, there's this classic book of design patterns that, um, that is kind of like the basic of object-oriented design. And when you ever use a particular library or API, like if you guys, anybody done like lots of Java development, you know, there's things like factories all over the place and APIs. And those are just common design patterns that everybody's agreed upon are as an efficient way to build uh, software, and there's the same type of thing for MongoDB schema design. And if you go to our website and look up MongoDB schema design patterns, there's an article on each one of these. So I'm, I obviously am not going to have time to explain all of these to you today, but you can see that there's all, a large list of patterns, and that list of patterns is ever-growing as um, we learn more things and people come up with new ways of optimizing. Uh, MongoDB use cases, but this is kind of a good starting point list. So really what we need to do as you're designing your schema is selectively apply these patterns to optimize your schema design to your workload. And I'm going to drill into the schema versioning one in a little bit more detail um, at the end of the talk. But the, let's kind of talk about how this, how this particular um, document model, this is for the chef's use case, was designed based upon those schema patterns. So this is kind of like what we're thinking is the optimal schema for the chef's use case. And the first thing I want you to notice is that there's three collections, people, comments, and articles. And the articles collection has a lot of information in it, right? We've got the basic information about the article. We've got a list of people. We've got the categories that are for this article. We've got the tags, and we've got a list of comments. But for the people, you notice we're only putting a few fields of each person in the article, right? And, the, and then the rest of the information about the people is in another collection. And the reason why we're doing that is we're optimizing this particular design for reads. So if you can think about this application, somebody says, I want to read this article, which is, you know, again, 10 million a day dominates our use case. 
Right in the document, we have the list of the names of all the people. So right on the page, we can, without doing any joins, any secondary queries, we can easily build the tagline you know, at the top of the page saying this was written by Mary, Steve, and John, right? We don't have to do anything else. But we're not carrying along in each document all of the other things about that person, like their email address and contact phone information. That information is stored in the other collection. We're also pre-calculating the number of comments associated with this particular article. So every time somebody adds a new comment, we're just going to increment that field. So again, this is a, what we call the computed pattern, where you pre-calculate some commonly used aggregates so you don't have to calculate them in real time. I mean, we could go against the comments collection and run an aggregation query to count all of the comments associated with this article, but that's going to require the database to look at potentially a thousand documents, where if we just, if we just maintain a counter every time we add a new comment, we can eliminate all that. For the comments, we're applying a subset pattern. So like I said, each, each article can have as many as a thousand comments, but we're going to store only the, first, the last ten comments in the article itself. Again, that's so that we can display the page about the article really fast. And this is just what happens like on any e-commerce site. If you're shopping for a product on an e-commerce site, you do a search, what you see is you know, the basic information about the product, and listed on that page is like the, the three best reviews, whatever best means to that particular site. Those are all stored together with the product. Then you can click on a little link, right, which will take you to all the other reviews, which is just analogous to the way this app is going to work. We, can have, we have the 10 best reviews stored in the article. We can serve those up real fast by one read to the database. And then if somebody really cares about the other 1,000 comments, we can just go and query the comments collection and get the rest of them. So now I'm going to talk about the schema versioning pattern in a little bit more detail. So the schema versioning pattern is a pattern that is really not designed to optimize the execution of the application. It's designed to optimize the release process, to optimize how quickly you can roll out new product capabilities. Right? So let's take a look at that. So first of all, no matter what we do, everybody's probably here has done enough software development that no matter what we do, we come up with the best document model. Things are going to, you know, a month from now, six months from now, things are going to change. There's going to be new data, new types of queries, new requirements, and we're going to have to make some changes. Right? So if you're doing relational, right, this, if you think about it in relational terms, there's essentially two types of changes that could happen. You might have your tables may stay intact, but you have to add new fields or take fields away or split fields or something like that. Or maybe your relationships change, and then you're going to have to do some significant surgery in terms of breaking tables apart and defining new relationships between them. So an example would be, you know, is let's say a version one of our application, we've just got, for each chef, we just have their home and work address, and that's, that seems fine for version one. But now, in version two, we want to get, you know, Alton Brown, you know, he's a renegade, he's, he only will be reachable on Skype or something, so we need to support other types of communication, and other chefs want to use WhatsApp, and Telegram and Signal, so we got to collect a lot more, support, have a lot more support in our app for different types of communication medium. If you think about what's required if we're doing this in relational, is we have to do this fairly complicated, orchestrated process by which we stop our application, we apply our alter table commands, port all our data to the new schema, right? So there's this down period, Saturday night from 2 to 4. AM or something, and then we roll out the new version of our app, and all is good, right? So if you have to do that, that is going to significantly slow down your ability to roll out new features and capabilities. And you know, plus that means that somebody's got to be in call Saturday night from 2 to 4 AM just in case something goes wrong, and I know we all love that. The option, the other option is to do the same thing in MongoDB, right? So now if, if Alton Brown wants to do, you know, we want to support Skype for his document, we can just change his document, you know, add the communication field with the array and put the new information in there. So that's kind of the MongoDB document model change. But the release process is a lot 
more convenient, and we're going to support that release process by putting a version field on our documents. So now what can happen with MongoDB is we just make our application a little bit smarter. We just have to write a little bit of code so that when somebody issues a query and the application reads a document and we find out it's in version one, the application just saves it as version two. So we can push that change out to the, you know, to a release that pushed that change out at any time, right? We can just now have our application, it reads a document in version one, it saves it in version two. And now that means our application just needs smart enough to be able to read both types of the, uh, version one and version two documents. Once we have that feature, we can then do our release anytime we want. Anytime, you know, assume, assume our application, we just made our application where it can work with both versions of the documents and convert version one to version two documents, I can push that out at any time. And over time, as my application, as users use my application, all my data gets converted from version one to version two. So we don't have to take any downtime for our application. So that's kind of one, you know, one of the powers of MongoDB and how that schema versioning problem uh, pattern really can make you releases um, much more efficiently. So just to kind of summarize, we kind of went through three things. One is the need to, uh, uh, to do actually document modeling, and it's really about making you know, MongoDB perform efficiently so you can execute things in a reasonable amount of time and a reasonable amount of hardware and for a reasonable amount of money. We talked about the different um, approaches for doing uh, schema design in MongoDB. So first, you know, identifying the workload, identifying the relationships, and then applying the schema patterns to get the um, optimal performance. And then specifically with the versioning pattern, it kind of really gives you a nice framework for improving the ability to which you can do agile releases. So there's a bunch of really great stuff on the MongoDB site. So Daniel Kopal, who is one of the education engineers at MongoDB, has written a whole series of blog posts on all these schema design patterns. I encourage you to uh, look at those. There's a really great data modeling course on university.mongodb.com. So that's another great place to go. And if you really want expert advice, MongoDB has a very robust um, services organization where you can, you know, somebody will actually look at your use case and help you make the best uh, design solutions. And you know, if you want to take this picture, there's kind of QR codes that will take you to those particular places. And please, like all the other talks here at MongoDB, please you know, rate and review and let me know how I did so I can get better over time. But if you hated it, like everybody else says, you, know, you don't have to do that. Um, so with that, I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I appreciate everybody coming. And um, I'll stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Awesome talk. Round of applause, Jay. Um, do you mind just putting the previous slide just back up in case folks want to capture that for reference? I know a few folks were trying to get their cameras yep, out Yep, you it. got it. Um, we're actually at time. If anyone wants to stick around, if you want to offer up to do any Q&A, but uh, we're, we're technically in a coffee break for the next 15 minutes. So it's like a mid-afternoon, grab a snack, grab a coffee. But do you want to, do you want to see if there's any, one or two questions out there? Or do you sure. want to just meet up with folks? Oh, there's, one, there's a couple coming up here. There's a mic over on the right. Let's try and uh, one, two, three, if we can, we can do that. All right, the question is about the uh, schema as code. Uh, so if we have changing business uh, needs, we're going to change the schema. We could do this with a bunch of scripts, and eventually that's going to get noisy. Uh, so I'll give you three very uh, easy examples, and I'm curious if there is a way to manage this as code uh, using a, a schema definition of some kind. Let's say, for example, in your yeah. chef uh, example, you have a bunch of names that are going to be uh, duplicated everywhere. Yeah. Uh, is there a language I can use to query where all Yeah, so MongoDB works? supports JSON schema. So you can associate a schema with every collection in MongoDB if that's the way you want to go. OK. And then you can apply patterns like, you know, chef's names must be at least 10 characters and can't have any symbols in them. You could do all that type of stuff if you wanted to. And would I be able to do, for example, link versus embed decisions from the schema and have code being generated for that? Well, you would, you know, the way you would do that is if you said, if this is a, a, a link field, you would say, hey, this field must be 
you know, an object ID or a 10 character integer or whatever, it can't be a sub document, right? Then, because if it was a sub document, then it would, then it would actually be an embedded document. Right. But that seems to be more of a documentation of a. Of yeah, there's a no document. foreign key constraints in okay. MongoDB, though. That you have to do with the application layer. All right, cool. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Hi, Jay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is really about what you say about when, uh, what performs best uh, as one of the principles. Mm -hmm. um, how do you balance, or what are some best practice to uh, deal with situations where the structure would be complicated? Uh, for example, folder structure, where you have folders and several level, level folders as well as the data integrities that comes with it. Like if you want to rename a folder name within a complex structure, and also make sure that they sync within different collections. Yeah. So def I didn't talk about it too much, but definitely the ease of which it, um, you know, one of the constraints is how easy it is going to be for the engineers to write this code, to write the queries, and things like that. And you make, make the decision that, I'm just making up things here, hey, if we go with one, document model, we only need four shards in Atlas. But if we go with this other document model, which is easier for engineers, and we think we'll introduce X bugs, but, you know, but we'll introduce fewer bugs, but it's going to be five shards, and it's going to cost a little bit more, we'll go with the, more, you know, the simpler solution, because we think it's just going to streamline our development. It's all part of the constraints that you have to consider when picking. You know, don't pick the, the most optimal document model for performance if it's going to slow down your development process because it's so complicated, right? OK. Yeah, it's, it's all a balance of you know, an engineering decision that you have to weigh the trade-offs. Well, but what about some uh, best practice to ensure data integrities between collections as some of the examples? Like if a user changed their username, right, and it's yeah. across all those different collections. That has to be enforced at the document, uh, in the application level. There's no constraint. I mean, I do have some customers that periodically run queries to look for, you know, usually the integrity constraints that are broken are due to, like, failures, like a server restart or something like that. But they will look for those and fix those. You know, run a script every night that looks for those and fixes them. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we can do one more question. Yeah, one more. Please. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I will quickly go over it. So, uh, thanks for a great session. Uh, yep. When you uh, explained that uh, versioning part, right, uh, towards the end, uh, when you were showing that, you know, whenever the uh, versioning uh, from version one to two, the migration is happening. Yep. Uh, I think uh, when the user references uh, the data, then again, it's being saved to version two. Is that is correct? That That's correct. What happens? So it's kind of a lazy conversion. And then normally what happens is probably going to be a set of users that haven't logged in in five years. So at some point, you write a query to just convert all those documents. Okay. But you know, the, 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 the advantage of it is you can just push out releases at a regular basis and not have to worry about synchronizing schema changes at the same time. So if I understood correctly, it's like whenever the user is accessing his data, at that point of time, it's getting updated. And so yeah, when it's read, when the application reads the data, it looks at the version. If it's an old version, it saves it to the database as okay. the correct so version. So it's basically a user-by-user -user update. Yes. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you.